Well, our scripture reading today is from Matthew 2, verses 2 through 12. This is the only place in the Bible that tells the story of the three kings. So when we listen to the scripture verse today, I want you to do active listening today. Really, don't don't just do your shopping list in your brain or what you're going to do after church. Listen to what I'm reading. Watch the words on the screen. And we're going to learn about this. So, So pick up the things that we know. So what do we all know? So he just said on the screen, if you know your scripture, the scripture says that the wise men came to Jesus 12 days after so if you know your scriptures, it's the exact phrase. So listen for where that is in here, okay, when we're doing this. Um, also, when you're, when you're listening, listen to all the places that refers to them as kings, okay? And then when you're listening, listen for when it tells you that there are three kings, okay? And then listen to what we're reading And listen to when it tells us that they saw Jesus in the manger, okay? So listen for all of this in today's scripture verse. And by the way, there's a a tradition out there of the Eastern Star. In fact, I think the Masons even have a subgroup called the Eastern Star, you know, whatever. So, so what was it? The Eastern? Okay. So, So the Eastern Star. So listen for when the scripture verse tells us that it's the star in the east, okay? So, so listen closely at the only place in the Bible where this three kings story is told, all right? Did I stress it too much? Did I overplay it? Yeah, could you listen? Listen. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened as all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all uh, all of the chief priests and the scribes and the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judea. For from you shall come a ruler who is uh, to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may go and pay him homage. When they, heard the, um, when they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that had been seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. So did you hear all those details in there? Everything we know about the story is packed right in there in the verse. The Windermere Union Church has had a tradition of celebrating Three Kings Day, and today we are celebrating. We're continuing that tradition. I have no problem with that. It's a great tradition. Beautiful song, beautiful children's moment, sense of community. This is what this day is all about, and we'll continue to celebrate this day. Today's service has been filled with Three Kings imagery. But the particular story that has been inside joke for the church that I've served for many years, this three kings, it's, if you ask anyone from my old church, it's, it's a joke for us. Whenever I talk about it, they just roll their eyes and throw their eyes back, oh, not this again. The three kings story is also a story that I use on my first day of class when I teach at the university. The very first day, this is what I talk about. On the first day of class, I give the students a quiz. That's how I start. I ask them some basic questions from the Bible. And I ask them questions like, according to the Bible, how many kings visited Jesus shortly after his birth? 
Nearly every single semester, I have about 100% of the students who answer three. We all know three kings visited Jesus lying in a manger. I mean, that's, that's Christianity 101. The students are shocked when I tell them they are wrong. And then I put up the scripture on the screen and we go through it line for line. And the Bible actually does not say anything about kings. The Bible never says they were kings. There's, it's not even a translation issue. There's, there's never a Bible in history, except maybe those little kid Bibles, you know, with the little big pictures that says three kings. It's just not in any of the Bibles. The word that's used is magi. Now, we've heard the kings referred to as magi before, but does anyone know what a magi is? You probably thought a magi was a king. No, magi is where we get the root for the word magician. And every other place in the Bible where the word magi is used, it's translated as sorcerer. But we get a little squeamish having sorcerers visit Jesus. So we call them anything but sorcerers. Outside the Bible, we call them kings. Inside the Bible, we call them either magi. You know, that's a Greek word. You know something's up when they're using the Greek word rather than translating. Oh, we're not going to translate this one. We'll just call it magi. Keep it ambiguous and no one will know what it is. They'll think it's a king. Um, or we might say wise men. Something, again, more a little ambiguous about this. So they were not kings, but they were sorcerers. Now, the next issue is the fact of how many there were. It never says how many. It never says they were three. It could have been two. It could have been 10. It could have been 20. It, it, it is true that the Bible says that he got three gifts, but 10 magi could have brought three gifts. You know, one magi could have brought three gifts. I brought three gifts to someone before. You know, it, it, it doesn't mean there were three. But it paints well on a, on a Renaissance painting of some kind of having one person each hold a, a gift. So we don't know how many sorcerers visited Jesus. So at this point, all we know is that an unknown number of sorcerers visited Jesus. Now, if we look at a map, we find another issue. The tradition of the unknown number of sorcerers that followed a star in the east, the eastern star. The Bible clearly says that the Magi were coming from the east. That's what the Bible says. The Magi were coming from the east. Well, if we read the footnotes in the Bible, it says that the Greek manuscript says that the star that they were following was on the horizon or at its rising. Well, if the Magi were coming from the east and they were following a star on the horizon, it was a western star. Remember the song we just sang, Western Leading? Okay. Okay. Or they were going backwards and following the eastern star. And going, <laughs> you know. So, so it's a western star. So why do we think eastern star? Why do we think that? Well, it's pretty obvious. From our perspective, it's the east. We're reading ourselves into the Bible. That's the biggest danger about the Bible. Not reading what the Bible actually says, but reading ourselves into the Bible. So Bethlehem is east of the United States. Bethlehem is east of the Greek world where Christianity grew into. East of the Roman Empire where Christianity grew into. East of Europe where Christianity grew into. So when we think of the star of Bethlehem, we think of that star that's in the east. But if we go back to the Magi, who were following a star, and they were coming from the east, they were following a star in the western sky. So, what do we know now? We know that an unknown number of sorcerers were following a star in the western sky, and where did they find Jesus? Not in a manger, not in a cave or a stable. The Bible says that these unknown number of sorcerers came to a house and found the toddler Jesus in a house. Again, this is not a translation issue. Every single Bible says that the Magi came to a house. We also know that the story, according to Matthew, King Herod ordered to kill all the children, two and younger. So clearly, King Herod thought that Jesus was about two years old. So also remember the video we just watched where it said that if you know your scripture, then you know that the Magi came to Jesus 12 days after his birth. Well, it just so happens, 
I do know my scripture. And the Bible never says that G the Magi visited Jesus 12 days after he was born. It just, it, we read it together. Okay, so according to the Bible, an unknown number of sorcerers followed a star in the western sky and found a two-year-old Jesus in a house. That's the biblical story. We read it together. Okay? Absolutely nothing about what we thought was true about the Three Kings story is in the Bible. None of it. None of it. Every detail of the story has been an extreme perversion of what the Bible really says. When I teach this in my class at the university level, I follow this lesson with a warning to my students. And I tell my students, I'm about to say the most offensive thing that I'm going to say all semester. And trust me, I'm going to say a lot of offensive stuff all semester. Here is the offensive statement. And this might go for you folks too. When you walked in here today, you were absolutely confident without a shadow of a doubt that the Bible said three kings visited Jesus lying in a manger. The only reason you could have possibly thought this was true is that every minister you ever knew told you that the Bible says three kings visited Jesus lying in a manger. Every Sunday school teacher you ever had told you that three kings visited Jesus lying in a manger. Every Bible study leader that you ever had told you that three kings visited Jesus lying in a manger. And I haven't even said the offensive part yet. Here comes the real offensive part. There are only two reasons why all these people told you about three kings. They were either ignorant of what the Bible really says, or they know what the Bible says, and they lied to you. I've been teaching for nearly a decade. And every time I challenge my students to give me a third option, and believe me, there are some students who really want to give me a third option. And no one's been able to. There are only two options. Either they were ignorant of what the Bible said, or they knew what the Bible said and lied to you and told you what they wanted to tell you. Those are not good options. It's the options we have person in the video we just watched invoke scripture. He said, if you know your scripture, then you know it says three kings visited Jesus 12 days. So we're all sitting here going, oh, the scripture must say that. In that case, I think it's probably ignorance, not as an insulting way, but ignorance means you don't know. And I think he probably just didn't know. He was, he was told by someone else that that's what the scripture said. And that's why he thinks that. And then he told you, and then you thought that, and then, you know, that's how, that's how the game works. It's just simply not true. It's not 12 days afterwards, that's the later tradition. So I use the example of three kings, and that's why my last church got to be a joke, and you'll probably be rolling your eyes at me after a few years of me coming back to this over and over again. But I use this as an example for what we always were just confident beyond a shadow of a doubt what the Bible really says. I mean, this is core Christianity, but the Bible really doesn't say it. But we really thought it did. I use the Three Kings story as an example because we really don't care. Who cares if they were kings or magi? Who cares if there were three of them or 30 of them? Who cares if Jesus was an infant or Jesus was two years old? But here's why it's so important. If most people thought that this was a fact, that three kings visited Jesus in a manger, then what else does the Bible talk about that we thought was a fact, but is not? Maybe something that is of value. Again, we don't really care if they're kings or magi or whatever. But what else have we been taught throughout our life through biblical ignorance? What else have we been flat out lied to about that we took as fact because the person telling us was of authority? What about things of value? What does the Bible really say about women? 
LGBTQ issues, abortion, and a whole other host of hot button topics. Things that we always thought were in the Bible, but what does the Bible really say? The Bible is often invoked to support many of these controversial topics. Also remember, and I've mentioned this before, for 1,500 years, we were not even allowed to read the Bible. Think about that, 1,500 years, we were not allowed to read the Bible. People were burned at the stake for translating the Bible from Latin into a language that people could understand. You were not to read the Bible. That's for the first two-thirds of Christianity, we had to rely on a priest to tell us what the Bible says. And after we were allowed to read the Bible ourselves through the Protestant Reformation, all that type of stuff, really researching it was hard and cumbersome. I mean, all the way up to when I was a child, researching was long and cumbersome. Who really put that em energy into it? It's only been in my adult life where for the first time, I always pull this out and show you the smartphone. We can research anything in a, in a second. Trust me, when I'm teaching my class, the kids who know how to use this, I'll see them all the time. I'll say, well, this is, you know, say some crazy stuff that I say, and I just see half my class go. And <laughs> they're fact-checking me right there on the spot, you know, and they're trying to see if what I said was true. You can fact-check in a moment's notice today. You couldn't do that even in my lifetime. So now what? This has been the big question. It's been a question that's asked multiple times in multiple different ways through the Bible studies that I've done, done at this church. Every time I do a Bible study, people's minds just explode, and then they keep on asking me, well, now what? Well, we're going to talk about now what? When our eyes are opened to the fact that everything we thought we knew is actually not what the Bible really says, how do we deal with that? Christian tradition tells us that three kings visited Jesus lying in a manger, but the Bible actually says an unknown number of sorcerers visited Jesus in a house. Is the biblical story, because it's biblical, is that what really happened? Well, no. To complicate this even more, in case it's not complicated enough, to complicate it even more is to understand that the biblical account is not any more or less factually true. The tradition of the three kings is the traditional story. The biblical story of the unknown number of magi is the biblical story. When we compare both stories to actual historical evidence, Pandora's box is open. We realize that neither story is factually true. We have historical evidence of King Herod because he's a king. We know all about him. Extensive records are written about him. He died 4 BC. That's four years before Christ. But he was at his birth. Okay. I'm just getting started. Okay. There's no historical evidence anywhere, no one wrote a single word anywhere in any historical document about King Herod slaughtering all of the children. You would have thought that someone would have like put it on a leaflet or something, you know, that, that monumental thing happened. If Mary and Joseph were from Nazareth, and the only reason they're in Bethlehem is they went to Bethlehem for the census, why are they still in a house in Bethlehem two years later? The Magi and the shepherds in the field, they knew that this was the Messiah. This was Jesus, the King, the Savior. They knew that and they came to pay homage to him. And then for the next 30 years, no one else knew. How can we go 30 years of Jesus' life and no one else knew that? The biblical account of the Magi is no more true or false than the traditional account of the kings. They are both stories that are told. Again, we're left with that huge question, now what? If our pastor is really standing in the pulpit, or standing behind his little iPad, whatever you want to call this, if he's really standing here in church, telling us that neither version is historically true, then does that mean it's all meaningless? 
does the whole house of cards come tumbling down? And the short answer is no. Things still have depth and meaning, and perhaps even more so when we detach them from our expectations that they must be historically accurate. Out of the past 2,000 years of Christianity, out of the past 2,000 years, it's only been in the past 100 years where we have been obsessed with the factualness of these stories. For many Christians, things just have to be proven factually true in order to have meaning. But for the first 1,900 years of Christianity, it had meaning and no one cared whether it was true or not. To address this issue of finding meaning in stories even when history and facts and science prove them false, I'm going to share with you a conversation I have with my students at the end of the semester. Now remember, we talk about the three kings the very first day of class. And then I go through 30 lectures over an hour each, and then we come to the discussion at the end of the semester. So you guys missed the 30 lectures, and you just have to jump and kind of figure it out yourselves, but we're going to jump to the end of the semester. And we are going to condense this and hopefully keep myself in time. At the end of the semester, I try to find the non-believers in my class. So I ask the students this simple question. Who here still believes all of the details are 100% true about the story of Santa Claus? <laughs> so I spend some time talking with these students. And sure enough, in that class, you know college students, they're trying to find themselves. I always find a couple of skeptical college students who don't believe in Santa Claus. <laughs> so I spend my time, because clearly I'm a believer. I mean, I had my picture taken with them. Now, how much more proof do you need? So I try to prove to these skeptical students that Santa Claus is very real. And I try to explain to them exactly how Santa gets those reindeer to fly. And when I explain to them how Santa gets those reindeer to fly, these students kind of fight back at me. And they're telling me things that they've learned in other classes, like the laws of physics or whatever. <laughs> and when I try to explain to these students exactly how Santa gets around the world in one night, they're telling me stuff like Einstein's theory of relativity and the space-time continuum and a bunch of a hogwash stuff. It doesn't matter how hard I try to explain to these students just how very real Santa Claus is. The skeptical students keep pushing back at me with things like science and history and logic. And they're trying to refute my claim. It seems that nothing I say could change their minds. They simply believe that the stories of Santa are not real. Then I asked these students, well, let me ask you a question. This past Christmas, did you receive gifts that were signed from Santa Claus? And some of the students, well, yes, I received some gifts signed from Santa Claus. And I said, okay, well, did you open the gift? And they said they did, they opened the gift. And then I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. did you keep the gift? And they said, well, yeah, I kept the gift. I was shocked and appalled. These non-believers who don't believe Santa exists kept this gift under false pretenses. Then I asked them, okay, whoa, 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 let me ask you another question. Have you given a gift to a younger sibling, a niece or a nephew or any child, and did you sign it from Santa? I was stunned to hear that these skeptical college students said, yes, of course I sent them a gift and I signed it from Santa. When I learned this, I, I, was, I was shocked. I didn't know what to do. I learned that these students who do not believe in Santa were signing their gifts from Santa, and I yelled at them, I go, liars, liars. You lied to a little child, shame on you. And as I continued to talk to these college students, I learned all kinds of interesting facts that just shocked and appalled me. I was amazed. I found out 
that some of these college students who flat out told me they don't believe in Santa, these college students went and got their picture taken with Santa. Does that not even make sense? These students were decorating their dorm room for Christmas. And they listen to songs that invoke Santa in the name of the song. Some of these students who totally do not believe in Santa Claus were participating fully in the life of Christmas. As someone who totally believes in Santa, I was offended at these non-believers that they would participate in my myth and not factually believe all of the details of this myth. And these students worked to calm me down. They would explain to me that you do not have to believe that Santa Claus is real to enjoy Christmas. You can deny the factualness of reindeer flying or any of the other parts of the story and still understand that these stories are there to teach us the value of giving to others. We still understand that these stories are told to bring us a sense of joy, a sense of togetherness. And as we participate in the myth of Santa Claus, it gives us a sense of community, togetherness. It gives us a warm, fuzzy feeling. The story of Santa teaches us about charity and goodwill towards others and peace on earth. My skeptical students have taught me that it doesn't matter if you believe in the historical fact of Santa or if you believe reindeer can fly. A little child who believes in this hook, line, and sinker or a skeptical college student who's questioning both understand the same deeper meaning behind Santa Claus. Just because you stopped believing in the myth doesn't mean that you stopped participating in the deeper meaning of the myth. Just because these skeptical college students embrace things like science and history and logic, it doesn't change their meaning of Santa, their participation, and how it affects their life. The same is true with religion. When we were a child, we were taught the Bible in some pretty simplistic ways. Why is that? Because we were children. When we were adults, we put an end to childish ways. When we became adults, we embraced things like science and history and logic. And we learned new facts that call some of those childhood stories into question. The factualness of many of our childhood Bible, biblical stories yeah, maybe not so factual. I know, I'm looking at the age of the congregation. I'm, I'm sure that you remember the Sunday school felt boards. Back in the day, they were all the rage. Before we had smart boards, we just had felt boards. And then you put up the little biblical stories on the felt board for the Sunday school kids, okay? Well, come on, let's face it. An unknown number of sorcerers visiting Jesus as a toddler in a house just doesn't present well on a felt board. Okay. But three kings visiting Jesus in a manger, you can put that on a felt board. It doesn't matter how factually true either story is. What's the deeper meaning? Why do we joyfully celebrate three kings in this church? The point of Three Kings Day is not to celebrate a historical, factual event. We celebrate Three Kings Day because we think Jesus is pretty special. The story being told, whether it be told about kings or magi or sorcerers, is a story that highlights how special Jesus is. We love Jesus. So we share the stories that reflect our love for Jesus. We know Jesus certainly had an impact on planet Earth, unlike anyone else ever. And we celebrate Three Kings Day, and when we read about scriptures like the Magi or the Kings or whatever you want to call them, we're simply celebrating how much we adore Jesus. We continue through our study of the Bible. Let us not fret about separating fact 
and fiction. Let's simply use these stories for what they were intended to do. Let's, let's use these stories to make us a better person. Let's use these stories to teach us what we need to do to have a better impact on the world around us. Today we celebrate Three Kings Day because we believe three kings bringing extravagant gifts to Jesus represents just how much we love the idea of Jesus. Amen.